Nothing starts up a firestorm quicker in sports debates than the term overrated. To many sports fans, to be overrated is the same thing as being a horrible player, when it couldn't be farther from the truth. Just because a player is overrated does not mean that they are necessarily a bad player. Even when talking about the official definition of the word overrate, have a higher opinion of someone or something than is deserved, says nothing about being bad. Yet this of course does not stop people from being offended and getting outraged. With that said, I am more than certain a large contingent of people will be pissed off at this list. And to that I say, too bad. This list covers the five most overrated players in NBA history. Starting off the list at number five, it's Tony Parker. Ah, uh, good old Tony. Where do I begin? Entering the NBA as a 19-year-old out of France in 2002, Tony Parker spent most of his career protected by the San Antonio media. That is to say, nobody really gives a shit about San Antonio, so a lot of the shady shit that Tony did goes unnoticed. He cares about what a player did on the court relative to their reputation. Make no mistake about it, despite the fact that I believe Tony Parker was overrated for reasons I'll get into later, he still did have a hell of a career. A four-time NBA champion, an NBA Finals MVP, what's up Steph, six-time NBA All-Star, and a three-time All-NBA second team selection and a third-team All-NBA selection in 2009 for good measure. So, you're probably saying, how is he overrated? Of course, this is all just personal preference, but I always felt that Tony Parker was never a dominant point guard, or at least one that deserved all the recognition that he got from being on a consistently good team. And quite simply, Parker just didn't have elite production on a consistent basis. He never finished top 10 in points per game, and only twice was he ever top 10 in assists per game, never finishing in the top 5. Some may say that Parker lacks the typical explosive individual stats of elite point guards because he happened to play on a team that, that prioritized sharing the ball. And while this might be true to some extent, Parker didn't necessarily dominate the advanced stats categories either finishing just top 10 in player efficiency rating twice in shares per 48 minutes one time. And while Parker does have a finals MVP on his resume, he wasn't necessarily a great postseason player either, finishing with a career postseason player efficiency rating of 16.8, which is good, but not superstar level. His career win shares per 48 minutes in the playoffs is a dreadful .84. So while Parker's postseason counting stats might look nice to some people, they are strictly a product of being at the right place at the right time and not because Parker was super efficient. Even in the five NBA Finals Parker appeared in in his career, his numbers still don't jump out on the page, despite a Finals MVP. With career averages of 16.5 points and 4.5 assists per game in 29 NBA Finals games, one could easily mistake Tony Parker for that of Kyle Lowry. There's absolutely no question that almost every NBA player in history would take Tony Parker's career in a heartbeat. Just, you know, make sure you don't let your wife anywhere close to him. Coming in at number four, it's Isaiah Thomas. Drafted 60th overall in 2011, Isaiah... Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not that Isaiah Thomas. The other Isaiah Thomas. The, the one who used to play for the Pistons. The one who Michael Jordan made sure didn't make the Dream Team in 1992. Gee, I wonder why Michael Jordan hated Isaiah Thomas so much. It couldn't be because Isaiah Thomas's Pistons teams beat Michael Jordan's Bulls three straight years in the playoffs. No, no, I'm sure it wasn't that or the fact that on several different occasions, Isaiah individually ate his lunch. I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on a diatribe. After all, this is a video explaining why Isaiah Thomas is overrated. So why am I showing clips of him doing very well against the second best basketball player of all time? Well, because I like to piss off Michael Jordan fans. It's funny. Anyway, let's get to the real reasons why Isaiah Thomas is my fourth most overrated player in NBA history. Again, like every other player on this list, Isaiah Thomas was not a bad player. I cannot stress this enough. He was in fact a great player for a short amount of time. And that's exactly why I believe him to be overrated. Many people have Isaiah Thomas as a top two or three point guard of all time, and simply, he just wasn't that good. He had about two or three truly elite seasons, and he was done being a good player by the time he turned 29 years old. And while Isaiah Thomas has much better per game averages than number five on this list Tony Parker had in his career, his advanced stats were not that great. At least, not as great as you would expect for a guy who was consistently considered one of the two or three best players at his position ever. 
Only two times in his career was he top 10 in player efficiency rating, and only three times was he even top 20. When it comes to other advanced stats categories like win shares, he only finished top 10 one time, and never finished top 10 in win shares per 48 minutes. He did do a little bit better in terms of value over replacement, three times finishing in the top five, but still, his peak was short-lived. And although Isaiah Thomas did get better in the postseason, winning two rings and a finals MVP, goddamn, Steph Curry must feel like shit, his postseason numbers still weren't anything that would make you think this guy was one of the two or three best players ever at his position. He ranks 52nd all-time in postseason player efficiency rating, and is just 58th all-time in postseason win shares. Again, these are good numbers, very good numbers even, but they're not those of a guy who should be consistently considered one of the two or three greatest point guards ever. I believe Isaiah Thomas is a top 10 point guard of all time, and even might be a top 5 point guard of all time. But do I think he's better than Steph Curry? No, he doesn't have Steph Curry's peak years or the ability to warp the dimensions of the court like Steph does. Do I think he's better than Chris Paul? No. I think Chris Paul was a better defender, and he has way better advanced stats, along with the fact Chris Paul has way, way more longevity on his side than Isaiah did. And although I'm usually not that high on players who played before 1970, Oscar Robertson has to be ahead of Isaiah as well. For not only his volume in his per-game stats, but his efficiency was amazing for his era. Assuming everybody has Magic Johnson as the greatest point guard of all time, you can make an argument still that Isaiah is top 5. But I would put Isaiah more in that next tier of guys like Steve Nash, Jason Kidd, and Gary Payton. And if you disagree with me, well, that's your problem. Coming in at number 3, it's Carmelo Anthony. I've always been puzzled by Carmelo Anthony's popularity. Sure, he scored a lot of points on a lot of shots, and he played for the Knicks for six and a half years, but still, I've never quite understood why he seems to have such a dedicated, rabid fan base, one that almost rivals those of Kobe and LeBron. The difference is, is that LeBron and Kobe are two of the greatest players of all time, while Carmelo is not. I've always had a theory that Carmelo Anthony's dedicated following is due to, in large part, because of his really awesome name, Carmelo Anthony. It's the type of name that just rolls off the tongue and it sticks out in a crowd. If Carmelo's name was something like Jeff Smith, would anybody really give a shit about the way his career unfolded? Would anybody really be so adamant that he deserves a second and third chance in the league when it's obvious that he sucks? I don't think so. I also think Carmelo has remained relevant through all these years because he's friends with LeBron James and because he was a part of that fabled top five picks of the 2003 draft, along with LeBron, D. Wade, Chris Bosh, and also 2004 NBA champion Darko Milicic. But let's get to the nitty gritty. Let's actually look at what Carmelo Anthony did on the court during his career. It's undeniable that Carmelo Anthony has scored a lot of points, 26,314 to be specific, good enough for 17th on the all time scoring list. There's no question that Carmelo Anthony is going to be a Hall of Famer once he retires but really that's not saying much anymore. does have a scoring title on his resume in 2013 even though he didn't lead the league in points that year. He's finished top 10 in points per game nine times and top five in points per game six times and that's very impressive until you start to look a little bit deeper into the numbers. Carmelo Anthony has been known as an elite scorer even though he's never really been an efficient scorer. In 13 of his 17 NBA seasons Carmelo Anthony has had a below league average effective field goal percentage. And again, scoring is what he was known for. And if you can't even efficiently do what you're most known for, how can you be considered a great player? And not even just talking about the individual stuff, but in terms of team-wise, Carmelo Anthony's never won shit. In fact, he's never come close to winning anything in the NBA. The farthest any of his teams have ever gone in the postseason was in 2009 when they made the conference finals. Okay, great. One deep playoff run in 17 seasons. And it's not like Carmelo was lighting the world on fire in the playoffs either. His efficiency gets even worse, both in terms of the regular and advanced stats. So let's try and sum it up a little bit. Carmelo Anthony scored a lot of points, although not on very good efficiency. He's nothing special as a rebounder. He's certainly nothing special as a passer or a defender. He never won anything, and his playoff stats get worse. What exactly am I missing here? Was it that people were mystified by his style of play? I highly doubt that. Even at his athletic 
athletic Pete Carmelo was never a high-flying athletic freak like that of a Dominique Wilkins or a Vince Carter. Unless you like watching jab steps and mid-range jump shots, I don't understand why you'd enjoy watching Carmelo Anthony. But hey, he's super rich, has a hot wife, and I don't. So I'm pretty sure he doesn't give a shit about my opinion. Number two, Bill Russell. On the surface, calling an 11-time NBA champion and five-time NBA MVP overrated seems like a pretty outlandish statement. Until you start to dig deeper into the numbers and look at what Russell actually did on the court. Russell is a consensus top 10 player of all time, and a lot of people even have him top 5, usually off the basis that he has 11 rings. And there is absolutely nothing more that grinds my gears as a sports fan than when people overrate players because of their ring count. But it's not just Russell's rings that make him overrated, as I alluded to earlier, his actual production isn't that of a top 10 player ever. I would argue it's not even top 20 or top 30. Bill Russell's calling card was defense, and the numbers seemed to back it up. He led the league in defensive win shares a whopping 11 times in 13 seasons. And for a big man, he also wasn't a horrible passer, averaging 4.3 assists per game for his career. Russell was also an elite rebounder, averaging a career 22.5 rebounds per game. And although that number is inflated by the era Russell played in, it's still impressive. My biggest gripe with Russell comes as a scorer. He just wasn't that good. Despite the fact that Russell played in an era with a ton of possessions and the fact that he had a major athletic advantage over all of his opponents besides Will Chamberlain, the fact that he averaged only 15 points per game for his career on 44% shooting is extremely underwhelming. Not only did he never come close to leading the league in scoring, he never even led his own team in scoring. Yes, a player who's consistently considered top 5 or 10 ever never led his own team in scoring at any point in his career. To me, that's just too much to overlook. Scoring the ball is, and always will be, the most important part of basketball. You can be a great rebounder, defender, and passer, but at the end of the day, you still have to put the ball through the hoop. And simply put, Russell just wasn't very good at that. Before I go into detail explaining why his 11 rings are overrated, I should talk about his 5 MVPs first. In his five MVP seasons, Russell averaged 16.7 points per game on 44% shooting, with a player efficiency rating of 19.4. He has five of the ten worst NBA MVP seasons in history in terms of player efficiency rating, and four of the worst six. Back when Russell played, the MVP was voted on by the players, and they probably gave Russell a few extra MVPs because they thought Wilt Chamberlain was just a stat-padding douche. Statistically, there's a pretty good argument that Russell didn't deserve any of the MVPs that he won. And this gets into the next segment of my argument for why Russell's overrated. He's always cited as having elite tangibles, which is the reason for his teams being so successful. And it just doesn't sit well with me. This isn't fucking Remember the Titans. This is not a Hollywood movie. These are professional basketball players. These are professional sports. At the end of the day, the team with the best talent usually wins. And in Bill Russell's era, he had the best teams in terms of talent. That's not to say that Russell didn't contribute at all to his team's winning, but saying that he's better than Wilt Chamberlain because he had a better supporting cast is just fucking ridiculous. Being in a better situation does not make you a better player, and a lot of people fail to grasp that. And besides, Besides, in a large majority of Russell's finals wins, he really didn't do anything. I mean, just look at this shit. And it's not just the finals, either. Russell's career postseason player efficiency rating is 19.4, which is good enough for 60th all-time. He averaged 16.2 points per game on 43% shooting. Yuck. I've always been of the belief that in every sport, the best players from any era would do well in any era. But Russell is an exception for me. If he struggled to score a efficiently in a much faster paced era against far worse athletes than what we have today, what would he be if he played in today's NBA? Would he even make the NBA? He would be a good enough athlete to make the NBA today for sure, but there's plenty of great athletes who aren't good NBA players. And even with all the modern advancement and training and all that stuff that Russell defenders like to talk about, that doesn't mean that he'd suddenly learn how to become a good offensive player. I think the best case scenario for Russell if he played in today's era would be as a Ben Wallace type of player. And the similarities are there. Both were considered the best defenders of their era, both were horrible offensive players and free throw shooters, and both won championships. The only difference is, nobody's pounding the table for Ben Wallace as a top 10 player of all time the way they do with Russell. And if you think I'm an idiot for having Bill Russell as the second most overrated player in NBA history, well, I advise you look at this photo of Bill Russell. Couldn't have summed it up any better myself, Bill. And coming in at number one, 
Kobe Bryant. I already know what a lot of people are saying right now. How dare you! Here's basically why I think Kobe Bryant is overrated. People just cannot stop comparing him and lumping him in with Michael Jordan and LeBron James. Michael Jordan and LeBron are the two best basketball players of all time and their production and efficiency dwarfs that of Kobe's. It's not even a contest. I also cannot stress this enough. Not being as good as Michael Jordan and LeBron James at basketball is not a sin. Not being one of the two best players of all time is not a sin, and yet Kobe fans and media alike just continue to compare him with Michael Jordan and LeBron James. And it's embarrassing. Look, I understand that Kobe copied a lot of Michael Jordan's moves and his mannerisms, and he jutted his jaw and made mean faces after making a contested mid-range shot. I understand that. But that doesn't change the point that people consistently overrate Kobe Bryant. Every argument for Kobe being lumped in with LeBron and Jordan usually relates to some psychological bullshit or some platitudes that actually have nothing to do with what happened on the court. Michael Jordan and LeBron were by far the best players of their eras, whereas Kobe wasn't even the best player on his own team almost a decade into his career. And there's really no concrete evidence that Kobe was ever the clear-cut best player in the NBA at any point. But for me, the biggest reason why I think Kobe Bryant is the most overrated player in NBA history is that he carries the reputation as one of the most clutch players ever, and he certainly wasn't that. Sure, you hear all the Mamba mentality and Vino and Killer Instinct and all the other BS that gets shoved down your throats all the time, but take a second to actually think. What is Kobe Bryant's biggest shot that he ever made in the postseason? What is the biggest and most memorable moment of his in the finals? He played in seven NBA finals and shot 43% or worse in six of them. In seven NBA finals, he shot just 41% from the field overall, and he was only the clear-cut best player in the finals one time in seven tries. All of the big shots that the Lakers made during Kobe's title runs came by either Derek Fisher, Robert Ory, Ron Artest, or Pau Gasol. In fact, you could argue that Kobe's most memorable postseason moment is when he shot 6 for 24 in Game 7 of the 2010 Finals, which he was then rewarded a highly controversial Finals MVP for, even though it probably deserved to go to Pau Gasol. While there are plenty of clutch stats out there that people can use to formulate their arguments, I like to go to a broader scale because it gives you a bigger sample size. And here's the facts. For his career in the fourth quarter of the NBA Finals, Kobe Bryant shot 36.7% overall, 23.6% from three-point range, and had an effective field goal percentage of just 40.2. In his last two final series wins against Orlando and Boston, he shot 29.7% in the fourth quarter. And while he did shoot free throws well in the fourth quarter, which gave him a true shooting percentage of 50.8, that's still nothing to write home about. So tell me, how can a guy who wasn't even the best player on his own team for almost the first decade of his career, was never the clear-cut best player in the league statistically, and wasn't efficient shooting the ball in almost all of his NBA Finals appearances be considered as good as LeBron James and Michael Jordan. While some may say I'm being disrespectful to Kobe, it must be known that he is one of the greatest players of all time. In fact, among all the players in this video, he's by far the highest on my all-time list, somewhere in the lower part of the top 10. His 13-year stretch from 2001 to 2013 was very, very good, and in my opinion, is his best argument for being as high as he is on the all-time list since very few players have ever had a 13-year span as good as Kobe had. But the numbers, or lack thereof, in Kobe's favor are just far too much to over look when it comes to comparing him to Michael Jordan and LeBron James. And sorry Kobe fans, but I really don't give two shits about what players think about him. Because what players think about Kobe doesn't change anything that he did on the basketball court. It didn't make him more efficient, and it doesn't make him as good as LeBron and Jordan. I cannot reiterate this point enough, and if it seems like I'm driving it home, it's because I am. I am sick and tired of seeing Kobe ranked as one of the two or three best players of all time. And because Kobe was tragically taken away from us too soon in January of 2020, I have a feeling that people will continue to overrate his basketball career. Kobe Bryant was great, and Kobe Bryant is a legend. He's just not in the same class as Michael Jordan and LeBron James, and Kobe fans need to learn that that's okay. Did you agree or disagree with my choices? State your opinion in the comments down below, and thank you for watching this video. Please continue to subscribe because this channel is just getting started, and someday it will be one of the biggest channels in the world.